A little different topic, but certainly uh, warrants health attention. The so-called poison train of East Palestine. Pedro Gonzalez shows us uh, how political forces led to the Norfolk Southern disaster, where multiple chemicals will spill. Were spilled. We'll talk about well, gases and chem and liquid chemicals as well. And uh, I was reading the list in an article I was reading, and it didn't mention carcinogenicity, but it all seems carcinogenic to me. And uh, We'll take a look at that. Five of the cars that derailed contained a combined 115,000 gallons of vinyl chloride, which, to my understanding, polyvinyl chloride is a carcinogen. So we'll talk about that with Pedro Gonzalez, senior writer at The Chronicles. We'll get right to it. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I, I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And as I'm preparing to talk to our guest, Pedro Gonzalez, it just occurs to me that we live in a time where it is so hard to find accurate information. Uh, we are hopefully going to get some from Pedro today. Uh, it, again, it is astonishing to me that you have to really work hard to get at the truth in today's day and age. Uh, Pedro is a senior writer at The Chronicles. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the American Principles Project. He has written about how the political forces is what led to the Norfolk Southern 32N disaster on February 2023 in Palestine, Ohio. Safety breakdowns that contributed to that derailment and, of course, hazardous, chemi hazardous chemicals. And uh, God knows what the full consequence will have been from that. We're going to bring Dr. Kelly Victory in here fairly quickly. But right now, let's bring in our guest, Pedro Gonzalez. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So as I was saying, I, I'm looking for exposition here. What, tell us from your perspective what happened there. Well, that is a small question uh, that requires a very long answer. And I think we I'm could sure. probably take, take the entire show because going back to what you just said, the first thing that I encountered while trying to actually find something out about this, this incident, and uh, by the way, I live in Ohio. I live about just under two hours away from East Palestine. Uh, that, that's how the locals pronounce it, by the way. I, I've been here for a few years in Ohio, and I was actually corrected by the locals because I, I pronounced it the wrong way. There's a Midwestern pronunciation to these things. But um, perfect. Right. Uh, the That was really the thing that struck me. And the part of the reason why I wrote this story is that it was really difficult to know, you know, what exactly had happened. And I thought that by going to East Palestine and talking to locals, talking to business owners, talking to people that live just a few yards or within a mile of ground zero, I would get answers. And I, I, I really came away with more questions. This is a town of about 5,000 people uh, in, you know, in the middle of the heartland. It's quintessential forgotten America. Something really big has happened in the backyard of this little community. And the people who live there feel in the dark about what's gone on because it initially it was i mean things have improved because of all the media attention now that they've there's been a kind of you know a forced uh correction to what it had initially gone down so now it, it's a little bit better i suppose but i spoke to people whose homes were surrounded by these blue containers with black tarps over them you know and as far as they can guess those are filled with contaminated material and they are contaminated soil and other things but if they go to the cleanup crews who are milling around in their front and backyard, pumping stuff out of the streams that run through the town, that literally run through the backyard to the people that I've spoken with, the answer they'll get from the cleanup crews is, we can't talk to you. And the mayor himself, Mayor Conaway, is really in a similar position. You know, This is someone who is trying to do well, someone who is part of this tiny community, like an, an actual member of the community, and he's also felt like, you know, in the wind and in the dark about what happened here. And, you know, we can obviously get into to the details, but I think that's really important to stress that there has been a breakdown, not just in the level of, you know, our infrastructure and how that's eroded over the years, 
but also in just our, our basic ability to communicate and react in a time of crisis, where again, something has happened and the people in whose backyard it's happened are really feel like they're in the dark and they don't know who to trust. Now, is the, you know, you keep hearing rumors that this thing was somehow nefariously caused. It wasn't just a breakdown of infrastructure. What's your opinion on that? No, I, as far as I can tell, I mean, this is, I mean, honestly, fact is often more, not just stranger, but more horrifying than fiction. Mm. I, mean, I think that's an interesting thing about the conspiracies that we spend to, you know, make things into to sound more sensational than they actually are. Well, I mean, the truth is pretty sensational. Pete Buttigieg said something like, you know, well, East Palestine isn't a big deal because this sort of thing happens all the time. That's true, but it's, on the one hand, it shouldn't be, you know, the way things are in what is, right. what, what we're told, the most advanced country in the world. So you think that we would have first world infrastructure, right? Where this is not actually something that happens all the time. But when you actually, you know, kind of take in that statement, you're telling me that this happens all the time. The, the, I've only just found out about this, that this is a common thing where you have trains that are loaded with really dangerous chemicals that just spill into small communities and people have no idea that this happens every single day or several times a year, thousands true? of times a year. Uh, there are thousands of derailments every year. And one thing I noticed, or I mean, I've, I'm sure you noticed this too, is that in the wake of this, there was an uptick in people just kind of paying attention to derailments. And so if you're, if you're on Twitter, you probably saw viral videos of, you know, a derailment in Arizona, Texas, whatever. Mm. And in some cases, these are trains that are carrying toxic chemicals. And, and um, there was actually, I think, shortly after the derailment in East Palestine, there was two more in Ohio. And the most recent one, it was initially uh, feared that it was also carrying toxic chemicals. The area was evacuated. Hazmat teams were, call hazmat teams were called in. I mean, this is actually worse than you know a, a a novel about it i mean it's interesting because there's actually a novel that was written that's very uh, similar to what happened in east palestine it's called white noise and some of the locals from my understanding actually participated in the film adaptation of white noise so it's kind of there was a cnn headline it was something like the, the residents of east palestine are now part of a of a, a story they helped write um but what's actually horrifying is the fact that we're in a country that's run by people that have just decided this is how you're going to live. You just have to accept this. I mean, that to me is actually I'm worse just, than hostile aliens, yeah, like aliens invading and forcing this on us. Yeah, that's it's the people pretty, that you trust. It's, it's, almost, it's a hard thing to swallow. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, in the past when I, you know, when I've been on other news agencies and things and had to cover events like this, there were always attorneys swirling around. There's always Aaron Brockovich and these liability yes. attorneys really swarming these places. Are we seeing that kind of thing go on here too? Aaron Brockovich did show up, but I, this is actually another interesting aspect of this is that, I mean, think of your environmental protest, right? Like the pot, numerous yeah. pipeline protests. There's, you know, you've got celebrities standing in solidarity, Instagram hashtags, all this stuff, right? Basically, something that's happening somewhere in 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 the heartland or you know in flyover country um becomes a national issue when it, it's somehow resonant with the left's understanding of environmentalism and social activism then you have bono you know fundraising for pipeline protesters or whatever but that's not happening in east palestine these people had to kick and scream to get people to pay attention to them and then when people did start paying attention to them, the reaction from people like Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg was initially just to blow them off and basically say, tough luck, this happens all the time, you're not special. And, and the, the reaction from the left, which again, right, they're, they're supposed to be the ones that care about the environment. They're the ones that are supposed to care about social justice. And I mean, this is really a story about how the corporate capture of, the, of, of of regulatory agencies has made us all less safe. This sounds like, you know, something that's out of a, out of a left-wing uh, thriller novel, right? They don't care. Right. Why don't they care? I mean, I mean, there, there are different reasons, but it, it I mean, one thing I, I, I know that it's, it's really, um, like you said, it's, it's difficult to swallow this, but East Palestine is it's white working class America. It's not a place that really incurs the kind of, you know, that the sympathy that the left would have, because, you know, th these are, the, I mean, this is Trump country. 
when, when I went there, there was, you know, there was well, in the but, downtown. But I would argue that we don't, we, I, I would argue we don't even know if the left would have sympathy. I, I'm going to predict they would if the press yeah. would report it. It really is the press non-reporting that doesn't even yeah. give the left an opportunity to have an opinion about it. It's, it's right. I well, mean, it's crazy. You're right. Obviously, there was this kind of the, the media did a terrible job of covering it initially. But at the same time, when we started to pay attention to it and when people like, you know, Tucker Carlson started to pay more attention to it and, and to talk about it, the left's reaction was the opposite. It was sort of like the right is trying to politicize no. this. But and that's just, a symptom I mean, it's, it's, of, of our time, right? Yeah, Isn't that yeah, the symptom of the right. time? If Tucker yeah. Carlson, it's like, it's like if Trump said something, you have to say no. If Tucker Carlson yeah. says something, you have yeah. to say the opposite. And and right. that that is a really unfortunate uh, yeah. example that's of right. how things are working in this country today. All right, yeah. well, I have a bunch more questions, but I want to get Dr. Kelly Victory in here because I do want to get into some of the health aspects of this and is anybody reporting on what's in the soil and the water and what to think and how many parts per million are likely to cause cancer and this kind of stuff? I'm sure you've got some of that, uh, you know, in mind. So let's get, get Kelly Victory in here after this quick break. Be right back. I think you know how much, Susan, and I love our Genucel skincare and how easy it is to try our one-of-a-kind customer packages bundled with our favorite products. Susan realized the other day that one of our kids stole some of our deep correcting serum from our stash, if you will. We had no idea that the lactic and hyaluronic acid combo is so great for adult acne, dark marks, and scars so not only are susan and i hooked on these products but apparently somebody else in our family is too somebody's ripping it off i know i'm a snob about the products i use on my face everybody knows it every time i go to the dermatologist's office they're just rows and rows of different creams retinols vitamin c cream under eye cream night creams scrubs and then when i get to the counter they're overpriced all kinds of products that you can all find at genucel.com i've fallen in love with this product at a fraction of the price. I've been using Genucel for six months now, and I'm very impressed. Great skincare is important at any age, and we love how amazing the results are. Thank you to Genucel. Plus, now you can find your very own bundle based on your unique skincare needs. Using cutting edge AI skincare technology, you can get a full skin analysis instantly and create a skincare regimen tailored towards your needs. Visit genucel.com slash Drew to check out our favorites and enter that promo code Drew, D-R-E-W, at checkout for added savings. All orders include free shipping and a free mineral mask. Order now. Go to genucel.com slash Drew. That is genucel, G-E-N-U-C-E-L, genucel.com slash Drew. Buy gold and get a free save to store it in. You heard right. On qualifying purchases from Birch Gold Group, now through March 31st, they will ship you a free safe directly to your door. Here's the deal. The Fed keeps raising rates because it is the only tool they have to keep inflation under control. But it isn't working. You can't spend your way out of inflation. And you've seen the impact on the stock market. You've seen the impact on your savings. Hedge inflation by owning gold. Whether physical gold and silver in your safe or through an IRA in precious metals where you can hold real gold and silver in tax-sheltered retirement accounts. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew for your free info kit on gold and to claim eligibility for your free home safe by March 31st on qualifying purchases. Again, visit B-I-R-C-H Gold, birchgold.com slash D-R-E-W. Some platforms have banned the discussion of controversial topics. If this episode ends here, the rest of the show is available at drdrew.tv. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. Dr. Victory, let's get into this. All right. Welcome, Pedro. Thanks so much for being here. This is a really important um, topic to me, not only as a disaster specialist with an extensive history in public health, um, but also because I am an Ohio native as well. I grew up, spent uh, most of my life in Cleveland, and I've got a lot of family uh, throughout the state of Ohio. 
In addition, I teach a class on leadership in times of crisis, and I am just shocked at the uh, real failures of leadership during this particular this particular crisis. So I want to start. I'm going to start at a high level and then get more granular, if you'll if you'll allow me. From you mentioned, and I find it likewise incredible that uh, public health officials, including Pete Buttigieg, would make the claim that you know it's no big deal. This stuff happens all the time. The, the concept, this level of of disaster, of uh, potentially you know fatal or or uh, critically impactful disasters happening, uh, and it's reflective of our infrastructure issues. What kinds of discussions have you had? What have you learned about this in terms of is this actually a daily occurrence? Do we you know we God knows I've seen trains going off the rails. It certainly sounds like. Uh, many, many times, uh, and and it seems to be happening more often. Where where are we in your you know from your deep dive in this with regard to the the quality of our infrastructure and specifically with this issue around trains? Yeah, Ralph Nader gave a comment to the the Intercept, and he basically described this in industry as as one of the most that the the regulatory industry when it comes to transportation and railroads is utterly captured. It's completely incapable of uh, being improved and made safer. This is, you know, according to guys like Nader, which I mean, in my, what what I found seems to confirm that, that basically the railroad companies like Norfolk Southern are really, really good at fighting legislation that is designed to make the transportation of hazardous materials safer, but from Norfolk Southern's point of view, less efficient and cutting into their bottom line. And I think that you can look at East Palestine and kind of see what this looks like on a, on the level of the community. And so the train derailed on February 3rd, and that's kind of when the story begins, right, for most people. But that's not actually true. The train broke down at least once on the night of right. February 1st. Right. And so I think that's important because the reports say there, it, it broke down at least once. Did it break down more than once on February 1st? Yeah. And why did it keep rolling after it broke down? The the crew, but when they spoke to CBS News, uh, they spoke on the condition of anonymity because they said they were afraid of retaliation from Norfolk Southern. And the consensus among the crew was that the train was too. Uh, that basically the the issues with it were related to its size. This this thing was uh, 151 right. cars, 18,000 tons, just a behemoth. And, and the crew said that mm -hmm. this has kind of become common in the industry. And it shouldn't be because we shouldn't be hauling trains that are this long. And at the same time that this has become common, uh, we're, the industry has also seen tons of layoffs. So basically, there are fewer people that are able to make sure that these trains are even safe to operate. And you've got one person doing, you know, wearing like three different hats, and and they're overworked. Can they're I ask tired. A question? Yeah, go ahead. I, I get I get the I get the understaff, but what what is it about? I, this is pure ignorance on my part. What is it about the the length of a train that makes it unsafe? It's the physics, the physics, the yeah, physics I mean, of it. I, <laughs> physics, but yeah, if the they're on a, it's on a straight. Is it the tur turning radii that gets? I mean, it's just you can put engines throughout the the. You know, why is it? Why is multiple engines and multiple cars pushed together on a single strand different than three different trains? Because because of the mass, the inertia, the ma the mass of a, of a train that much weight moving at a certain speed, it's going to number one pile up and go further uh, and be spread got further it. if in fact it crashes. So, so it's, if, if it stops the, or if it breaks, okay, got it. Correct, yeah. and just got the it. amount of of, of, yeah. of toxic material that's being you know there's a, a reason that we um, that we don't allow, for example, even an eighteen wheeler to transport toxic materials. On certain interstates, or through a through a you know over a bridge, or through a tunnel, because the results could be disastrous if that single eighteen wheeler were to crash. Now you've put right. one hundred and fifty eighteen wheelers worth of stuff of toxic soup um, on this thing. So it, it is it. it is beyond a potential disaster. So I'm sorry, Pedro. Go back to where you were telling a good story here. No, yeah, my no, phone. that was. No, no, and there's so much there, right? By the way, three months before this derailment, Pres uh, Norfolk Southern President and CEO Alan Shaw was in D.C. where he snapped a picture with Pete Buttigieg, and he put posted it on LinkedIn, and the caption is about basically how 
Norfolk Southern is committed to social justice and corporate responsibility. Of course, they're subscribed to ESG and all that stuff, but it's a lot of kind of feel good. You know, we're, we're in Washington to sing praises to Mother Earth. Right. But in reality, the Washington Post actually obtained documents that show that the trip to Washington uh, was also Norfolk Southern raising alarms over uh, proposed regulatory changes regarding brakes that, again, would make the train safer. But from Norfolk Southern's perspective, specifically safer when it comes to preventing derailments, by the way, but from right. Norfolk Southern's perspective, well, this is this is like this is this would take too much time to implement. It would cost way too much money. And ultimately, it would it would mess with the supply chain and our ability to, to, to you know, move freight around the country. That was three months before the train derailed. Right. And before that, I mean, go back to 2012 in New Jersey, there was a really similar derailment where 23,000 gallons of vinyl chloride uh, spilled. And that actually was that ha that happened amid a streak of other derailments. And so it kind of spurred the wheels of change in action uh, under the Obama administration. But industry pressure managed to hamper the ability of even Obama. You know, like, you know, like again, this goes beyond Republicans, and Democrats. The Obama administration was not able to actually get the reforms it wanted because of industry pressure. And a very similar thing happened under Trump. And as far as we can tell, like Biden hasn't been much better on this issue uh, on this issue either, obviously. And, it, it, you know, his reaction to it says everything. But going back to, you know, East Palestine. So February 1st, you have the first red flags. And then on the night of February 3rd, there, there's all this. I mean, I'm sure you've seen these videos of the train passing uh, behind businesses and residences. Uh, about 20 miles outside of East Palestine from where it would derail, where it shows that there's flames and sparks uh, flashing underneath one of the cars. Right. And this is captured across basically as the train is traveling closer and closer to East Palestine. But according to investigators, the crew was not notified that something was wrong with an axle until it was just outside of East Palestine. It's like you have to really put this in the context of, of, of just systemic failure. And, and it, uh, the investigators correctly noted this was 100% preventable, that it was shockingly preventable at every stage, and, and yet it happened. Right. And unfortunately, Buttigieg is right. This actually kind of seems to be part of our infrastructure. No, and, and let me interject here. Uh, you're exactly right, Pedro. There are these uh, early warning safety uh systems in place, but a safety system is only as good as you know you, your ability to act on it and have it reported to you. Uh, it's not dissimilar. And I don't want we you may know that Drew and I do a lot of talking about COVID and what's going on with the pandemic. Uh, again, you know, we have an early warning sign in place with the VAERS system, but they ignore it. If you if you put a warning sign in place, whether it's video or alarms, and you don't alert the people who are actually driving the train, that something is going on, that, that safety system is essentially useless. So here you have this 150, you know, car long thing, behemoth, as you called it, rightly so, um, you know, powering on towards a highly, you know, a, a, uh, a residential area. And it, it just to answer Drew's question again, it's not just the mass, but the velocity, you know, the centrifugal force, if something goes around a curve, uh, the, you know, the length of the whip uh, is, is, increased the velocity of the of the last cars are grossly you know greatly increased as you go around a, a curve um i don't know where this thing ultimately finally went off the rail let's talk about that next what is the maintenance of the actual track itself what do they know what caused this was it a failure of an axle was it a failure of the track was it an issue of speed you know velocity around a curve why did it go off the darn rail so the the investigation and again, this is, goes back to the issue of just the lack of lack of our ability to communicate and react to these incidents. The train derailed on February third, but the investigation that that told us that that basically an alarm had gone off uh, pertaining to an axle issue, and I mean that's that's as vague as it is right now. There was an axle issue. Mm -hmm. um, that report was not released until February twenty third, and mm -hmm. uh, we and and then. This uh, another report related to how the the cars were vented because there was the we, I mean, we we're going to get into this but the the whole question this is the most controversial thing basically the decision to dump the chemicals in East Palestine yes. and then do a controlled burn right 
Well, again, we didn't know until March 1st, according to a union rep, that a lot of the first responders who were involved in that whole thing, I mean, this is really harrowing. It's, it's another aspect of the story that hasn't been told. According to this union rep, several of the people that were involved in that emergency effort were not provided with the proper PPE. Uh, they, they were not given the proper protective equipment. One person who spoke to this union rep, th this, this rep sent a letter to Governor Mike DeWine on March 1st. And according to him, uh, there were people that were experiencing you know, extreme nausea and, and headaches mm -hmm. and were asking mm -hmm. to go home because obviously they felt terrible and they, they didn't feel safe. And, and basically they didn't get any answer. One person asked if he could if he could get off the scene, and his supervisor gave him an answer to the effect of "I'll get back to you," but he never did. And then for days after right. dealing with this, they had nausea and headaches and stuff. And of course, Norfolk Southern responded by saying, "You know that's not true. Everyone had proper uh, proper PPE." But we, I mean, it's it's basically their word versus uh, somebody else's word. Well, um, right, COVID has right. taught us how people use how people <laughs> use proper PPE. I mean, they're they're using their PPE until it comes time to get a drink of water or until it's time to right. have a snack, and then they're used to pulling it down. If anything, the COVID behavior is sort of adulterated what they might have done there. But I, I'm asked, I want to go back to really quickly because these chemicals. I'm just reading about these chemicals. These are very seriously dangerous chemicals. Do we know yes. how bad the contamination got in the soil or the water? I'm just reading the Environmental Protection Agency does not allow for more than two micrograms per liter of vinyl chloride. I'm guessing there must have been much higher concentrations in various sources of certainly water. Well, before before we go there, let's talk about how what happened, the, the spill, why they dump, okay. the, the dumping it and then deciding to get it into the soil, you know, the soil, um, because that's where I really want to go next, Pedro. You know, from a they made a decision. They, you know, somebody made a decision that the this um, toxic soup was at risk of exploding, risk of catching fire and exploding. So they made a concerted decision to dump it and have a quote controlled explosion to to make it a con yeah. controlled. Their word, not mine, because this was the, yeah. the least controlled thing. Why in the world would you make a decision? to explode something, to set it on fire without evacuating everybody for miles and miles and miles around mm. beforehand. Um, yeah. They didn't do that. So talk about the, how that decision got made. Well, if you look at DeWine's statement, so train derails on February 3rd. And by the way, when it derailed, this is one of those things that's so murky. There were people on scene and people in the town who reported a horrible smell in the air. Mayor Conaway said, you know, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, and as far as we're being told, none of the, 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 the cars carrying chemicals have been, uh, have, have been punctured or whatever, or ruptured. Um, but he described a, like a horrible smell. There was a girl that I interviewed, her name is Zusa. She, because uh, it, it derailed around 9 p.m. and you know, these people had no idea what happened. They just heard sirens. They heard they heard commotion, but she knew something was wrong when her nine year old son with asthma began vomiting, and when she had difficulty breathing, and, and their house was filled with this horrible smell. And so at three a.m., she she and her son fled, and and they've been actually staying across the border in Pennsylvania for for much of the time. They still haven't gone back home because they don't feel like it's safe, and they don't trust the people that have been hired to conduct the testing. But so many people said this, the fire, even the fire chief of East Palestine, and I tried to talk to them and they didn't want to give me a comment, which I can, I can understand. Um, but when I, I wanted to talk to them because the fire chief said uh, to reporters early on, if you don't have to come to East Palestine, don't. And, and he, he said that right after saying, as far as we can tell, the air is safe. However, if you don't have to come here, don't. Like this doesn't inspire confidence, right? And, and right. as soon as it derailed, the train was on fire. I saw video from people that actually work at Norfolk Southern. Um, or, or sorry, there was video that was posted uh, by Norfolk Southern employees um, where you could see that other cars were on fire. And, and I mean, everyone, you know, has that gigantic black mushroom cloud imprinted on their memory now. Mm -hmm. But there was it was burning before that. And, and so, again, mm -hmm. it gets to the question mm -hmm. of what stuff already, you know, in the soil or whatever before the before the, the so-called right. control vent. Um, but as far as, you know, the quality of the soil and the water and all that, this is all stuff that's in the air. Um, and it doesn't help 
that Norfolk Southern brought in organizations like the Center for Toxicology and Environmental Health. This is a private contractor. Uh, they've been involved in everything uh, like from the EP, uh, the, the BP um, Gulf of Mexico spill to a number of other similar uh, kind of corporate disasters where there's an environmental incident and then, you know, they have to prove that it's safe. And so uh, they bring in agencies like, like the Center for Toxicology and Environmental Health to conduct testing, but they're controversial because every single time that they get brought in, they always say everything's fine. There's an article in the New York Times about it. And, and the New York Times actually documents all these different crises, crises that they've been involved in where they say the same thing. It's safe. It's totally fine, including- Is, the, the, is the there an organization- authority. Is there an organization that's more reliable? Uh, I think it's just difficult to get over that, that, that public perception of you're just kind of here to tell us what Norfolk Southern wants to hear. And obviously, you know, to make matters worse, I'm sure you heard people were being asked to sign whole harmless agreements. Right. Which right. most locals interpreted to mean if I get cancer in a few years, I can't hold you responsible. And then Norfolk and so you, Southern- mean that? Right. What's that? What? I was going to say, remember, you know, we, we, we've got we, we've got lawsuits going on now yep. uh, for exposures at Camp Lejeune to contaminated drinking water that happened back in the 1980s. It can take yep. decades mm -hmm. for people to really realize the profound health effects. So, yes, Drew, we're looking at those five chemicals that were on board, including vinyl chloride. Mm hmm highly toxic and ethylene glycol, but vinyl chloride when exposed to heat turns to phosgene gas which was a chemical weapon, you may recall. Mm. Um, you know, th th these are, it's not just each, you know, there are five chemicals on board, but when they become exposed to things like water, heat, soil, they can turn into, they can get, you know, turn into other compounds that are equally or more toxic. So the idea that this is, that these people were told early on, first of all, not evacuated before this quote controlled burn, which you know, that, that's not controlled if you le left everybody in place. And then we're told immediately that everything was 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 safe yeah. to go back. Um, yeah. When the people are experiencing hellacious, what, what percentage of people, Pedro, in your experience being there, what percentage of people were having uh, either were aware that there was something very bad going on and were actually having symptoms uh, from this, even if it was just feeling lousy? Almost everyone I spoke with described something, um, whether it was a rash, um, a rash on their body or on their hands, uh, whether it was like a low grade headache. Uh, the last time that I was there, right before I published the story, I was told by a reporter that his colleagues had actually gone over to the town uh, nearby called Negley. It's, it's about three miles away uh, because they had reports of, of a kind of chemical smell coming from a stream. And they described it as paint thinner. And when they were done, um, covering it, they, they all came back with headaches. And, and so that's, the, that's the most common thing I'm hearing is that, is that people just kind of report this, this persistent kind of headache and, and the rashes seem to be kind of going away. Um, but I spoke to a, a business owner and gave me a really, you know, a, a typical story was that, uh, when they came back to open their business, it was filled with this awful smell. Uh, and, and, I mean, an important part of the story is not scaring people more than they already are, right? But but the sure. questions that they ask reflect that. You know, what about all the product in my store? Do I have to get rid right. of this stuff? I have no idea. What's the guidance on this, right? And, and so she said that when, when she and her son came back into the store to open it after the evacuation order was lifted, uh, there was this horrible smell and, and that her eyes and throat really burned. And that she said for days afterwards, her son could still smell it. It's, it's this terrible, irritating odor. and. I heard that from so many people that I spoke with, uh, whether it's at the shop or in their home, uh, especially the people that live really close to um, Ground Zero. I, I saw, I spoke to one business owner who has not reopened their shop uh, since the incident because they don't feel comfortable doing so. They didn't want to go into details why, but that was it. Um, so, like this is this is kind of like a waking nightmare for these people, and it's it's made all the and, worse and, by the uncertainty. And Kelly, as as miserable as that all is. I, I still, what I worry about is some of these, some of these hydrocarbons can rip through oh. the biological material and, and clip DNA on their way through. And now you've got cancer or enough clips of oh. enough DNA. Uh, and you get, you got a really serious problem and, and that won't show up for quite some time. And all, several of them I've been right. reading about are quite capable of doing this. So it's, it's really the horror 
I, again, we don't want to frighten these people, but that's what worries us is what's to come. No, I, rightly so. And I think you've got to know back to this issue of the politicization of it. You know, if if two, you know, dolphins show up on the beach, you know, the, the left goes nuts. You know, God forbid you you endanger some species of bird uh, or there's some, you know, environmental uh, contaminant that is, you know, affecting birds. You hear all about it. But we have now this disaster. Clearly, people are having acute Ill, you know, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, headache, uh, rashes. But the bigger issue, as Drew, as you're saying, is what are the long-term impacts? And we have people, you know, Mike DeWine is a Republican uh, governor of the state of Ohio, came down and was the first to say, he, you know, he, it's safe. And I and I thought, really, if, if you believe it's safe, yeah. then frankly, the right thing, and I posted this on social media, Pedro, within days, I said, if you think it's safe, then out of an act of goodwill, you know, Governor DeWine, move your family and yourself down there for a few right. months. You bathe, you yeah. bathe in that water. You drink that water mm -hmm. um, as right. a as a show of good faith. You know, there's I don't know if you're aware of the idea of um, toasting when people, you know, hit, yeah. hit glasses That's right. together. That's you know, medieval concept. It came from because of the fear that your your friend, your your a uh, colleague had poisoned you with hemlock. Yeah. So you'd yeah. bash your glass uh -huh. into theirs, hoping to spill some of your uh -huh. grog into theirs, and yeah. then say, to your health, you drink yeah. first, <laughs> to your health. Uh, yeah. And that's what I would say to these guys who are claiming it's safe. Good, you first. You know, yeah. this is just yeah. hellacious. No, that's so well put. And I think, I know that we were talking about the, using categories like left and right, but in this story, I tried to show that this is actually something that goes beyond left and right, Republican and Democrat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to what I'd said earlier to, to kind of show you what I mean about capture of, of regulatory agencies. Um, so the Obama administration was obviously undermined in their attempts to reform uh, transportation safety. Uh, and then, like I said, three months before the wreck, you have Norfolk Southern in D.C., uh, raising alarm over uh, a proposal. It wasn't uh, breaks. It was actually for... Um, mandating that in most cases you have at least uh, a certain amount of crew members who are involved when a train is transporting ha hazardous materials. Norfolk Southern argued that that would be mm -hmm. too cost prohibitive for them to implement. Under the Trump administration, you have uh, the repeal of safety regulations regarding brakes. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's just this runs through every. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. The lobbyists mm -hmm. get their way, mm -hmm. and I think right. and, and on a much smaller level that has almost kind of a comedic effect. You know, you have Troy Nels, this Republican from Texas, who gets angry at J.D. Vance for telling people, look, I don't wanna scare you. I, I, by the way, I think he did such a great job because J.D. was trying to do two things, not scare people more than they're already scared, and also not take at face value you know, what these contractors at Norfolk Southern has brought in to say everything's fine. He's trying to kind of stalk a middle ground, which I think is really, you know, you know he deserves a lot of credit for that. And so his recommendation was just drink bottled water for now, because there's a lot of it, you know, it's being provided to you uh, in, in large quantities. So why not? It's it's the least that you can do to keep yourself safe, right? Troy Nels freaks out. He says that it's so irresponsible to, to say that, to, to ask people to drink bottled water instead of tap water. And if you look at donations for Troy Nels, uh, he, he's received hundreds of thousands of dollars from the transportation sector, from donors in the transportation sector, which of course includes railroads. And he's also received money directly from Norfolk Southern. So even if, I mean, the problem with this is that even if Nels is actually being sincere, which is, I mean, that's really bizarre if that's actually true, um, it's just impossible to take him seriously because, because of the amount of money that flows into campaign coffers from uh, from this sector and from companies like Norfolk Southern, which donates to Republicans and Democrats. Wow, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I don't even know where to take this. I feel so badly for the, these people, you know, with regard to go back for a second to this issue of having done this, you know, exploding this thing, setting it afire without having done. It doesn't appear that they did any of the sorts of modeling that should have been done prior to doing that in terms of, yeah. you know, where is this thing likely to go? How big yeah. a, you know, cloud are we likely to produce? You know, how far, where's the wind? How, how far an area should we be evacuating? 
It's my understanding that they only evacuated about a mile radius. Is that correct? There was, so there was two, yeah, it was, it was a one mile evacuation within a mile. Um, and, but it was done in two phases. There was like an initial evacuation on the morning of February 4th. And the, the original plan was to uh, allow the trains to burn out until Norfolk Southern deemed it safe for firefighters to move in and finish extinguishing the flames. But then there was reported a change in one of the cars carrying chemicals. And then that's where the concern was that th- there would be a kind of a chain reaction where one car would detonate and then the, all of the others would go too. And if you read Mike DeWine's statement, you get the impression that the decision to vent came from Norfolk Southern because DeWine seems to kind of defer to their expertise. And again, this is an issue that's been so controversial because according to Mayor Conaway, Norfolk Southern promised that the trains would not start rolling through East Palestine again until everyone had returned to their homes and was, was basically, you know, that life had returned to normal. Everyone said, including Conaway, that as soon as the evacuation order, the mandatory evacuation order, order was lifted on, on the night of February 8th, um, trains began rolling within five minutes. And, and that infuriated locals. Conaway was furious and told the reporters exactly that. That, you know, I was told that we would get people back in their homes before it was business as usual for Norfolk Southern. That wasn't right. the case. And wow. so... Yeah, and I mean, there's really quick. There's also the question of soil encapsulation. Um, yes. The the, the, chief, the mm-hmm. fire chief of East Palestine said that when when the train runs through, you can kind of sm- there's this kind of like bad smell in the air. And I've heard that from locals too that when a train runs mm-hmm. through, there's a bad smell in the air. Well, it might have to do with the fact that East Palestine just or uh, Norfolk Southern just kind of buried a lot of the contaminated soil and then put tracks over it. And and I spoke to a local that that actually uh, works in landscaping and, and in particular um, he's he his company does soil remediation, and and so what that means is it, from from his perspective when you have something like this, what you're supposed to do is mix the soil with concrete, lime, or cement to basically trap mm-hmm. the contaminants so that they can't leach mm-hmm. off into, into bodies of water. Norfolk Southern didn't do right. that. As far as anybody can tell, they just mm-hmm. dumped the soil in it, put the tracks over, and then started rolling trains through. That's oh what I was boy. just going to ask yeah, about they, the yeah. soil, because normally you would either we we know this stuff is already leached into into groundwater. We know it'll go further uh, to the lower water tables. Um, it, it's the nature of hydrocarbons. And I was hoping I was going to ask you, what are they doing for soil mitigation? Um, many people would have suggested that they dig down X number of feet and haul off all of that soil uh, entirely. You know, it is contaminated. Or at least test. They, it should be easy to test, yeah. right? Kelly, it should be very easy to just drop down there and test. Let's see, yes Absolutely. or no, it's it's okay or it's not okay. Right, but they know that at least X number of feet of, of soil have been contaminated. So you know you're gonna have to haul out at least Presumably. some component or should be uh, if they're actually burying in, in the, you take it off and you bury it somewhere in the middle of you know the desert somewhere where there's uh, no, no residential areas around. So you're mm. saying that they simply dug it down and essentially tilled it into the soil? Great, in, so in the that just gets it closer the to the water table. Yeah, and and oh, Norfolk Southern, time. Norfolk Southern's response to that criticism doesn't inspire confidence, and it's it, it basically they say that they moved the soil, but <laughs> they're going to take more steps to properly remediate it. So it, it's they're really they they're really good with these statements where they you know they, they'll use this kind of language that comes very close to admitting that you're right in your criticism. Uh, it, it's I mean. I, I guess they probably have a lot of experience when it comes to this kind of stuff. But basically, this statement does not inspire confidence because they don't say we remove the soil. They just said, "Look, we right. did we had to, we did what we had to do on the night it happened, uh, and we're going to fix it in the future." But the question is, is like if, if Norfolk <laughs> Southern has to like rip up the tracks to to you know excavate that contaminated soil, are they going to do that? I mean, most locals don't think so. Well, right. certainly with the We're, capture of the uh, regulators, I, and again, this is a common topic for Kelly and myself. We've been worrying about this as it pertains to the regulatory capture with the pharmaceutical industry. So, and uh, I noticed that uh, Vivek Ramaswamy is sort of pointing out that corporate capture or corporate coziness with agencies and government throughout our throughout our society, not just these two major industries. So, I'm suspicious right. that we're seeing symptoms of something that is. 
uh, maybe greater than we knew and, and has to be sort of dealt with. Back to the, just very quickly, the <laughs> there's got to be attorneys swirling around here and mm -hmm. there's got to be liability in what you're describing here. Do they not understand that? Do they feel so confident with their government uh, sort of protectorate that they're not going to get into trouble? I, I don't understand that they, they really should be rushing to protect themselves, seems like. As of the time that I published it, there were 15 lawsuits that I was aware of. There are 15 lawsuits. Uh, there, I think it's it's called a mass action lawsuit um, that, that locals mm. are trying to put together. Um, and you're right, though. It does seem like Norfolk Southern is confident that it's going to come out OK and it's just going to be business as usual. And that might actually that might actually be the case. And, and at least one person I spoke with who lives in East Palestine um, said something to that effect. And, and they were, you, I could kind of tell that they were a little bit sad about it. I mean, for obvious reasons, but it was basically a sense of we're not going to get justice because they always, when this happens, you know, the, the, the big corporation always gets rid of it. I mean, in many ways, Norfolk Southern well, is but like- But they bill. maybe, you know, in insurance resources or slush funds that are put to the side that are pr ready for this kind of thing. And so they don't really have to yeah, absolutely. Know, I mean, it, wrinkle it all, like they I said, just it, move on. Yeah. And like I said, it, it's so easy to, to see Norfolk Southern as the perfect villain that, that always survives things like this. I mean, it's top shareholders include Vanguard Group and BlackRock, you know, like it, it's, uh, it, it is really part of the vampire squid family that uh, Matt Taibbi used, the, the term he used to describe Goldman Sachs. It, it's part of that. Yeah. This big leviathan that's just unstoppable and always emerges unscathed. And you know, maybe they pay out a settlement of a couple million dollars, but at the end of the day, that's you know, that's chunk change for these people. Um, so he, that so here, we, so here we are, four plus weeks into this. Where Pedro, where are the people of East Palestine? Have the vast majority gone back? Are most people like the woman you were describing, who's living off in Pennsylvania? Where are the people? So. I I published the story uh, in late February, and by that time, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to to remember all the the people I spoke with. By that time, um, it, it kind of looks like life is returning to normal, but at the same time, I think it's just the character of the locals that they don't like to complain. So, for example, the the store owners who had a sign on their window that said "closed until further notice," the only thing they would tell me was you know that their business was closed because of the crash that was it but they just didn't want to talk to me and the sense that i get from a lot of people is they just they really just want to get they want to try to get back to normal um and they don't really want to complain um and but zusa the the girl that i spoke with with the nine-year-old boy um he uh, she had still not returned home she 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 was still staying in a, in a hotel and there was this whole issue where basically um, her her housing costs were being subsidized, um, mm -hmm. but once the tests came back clean for air and water uh, for East Palestine, the housing help went away. And so she's been trying to fight that because she does not feel safe going back home because she lived within the one mile um, radius of, of where the train derailed. And, and so she just doesn't feel like it's safe to go back home. And she actually had a really bad experience with the Center for uh, Toxicology and Environmental Health where she got into a nasty argument with one of their toxicologists who told them that they can't connect any of the symptoms people are experiencing to the air quality in East Palestine. And I, I managed to get a comment from her uh, that said basically that because I wanted to confirm that. And of course, that's at odds with people that are saying that they're experiencing headaches and they're smelling things that are, that, you know, that are, are foul right. and stuff. And so, so I, I couldn't tell you, you know, what percentage of the town is back and, and uh, back in their homes and back in business. Um, but I mean, the people of East Palestine are resilient. Uh, the model of the town is uh, where you want to be. And I think that says everything about this, this type of American community. It's people that are rooted. It's people that are living here for family, for community. Uh, it's because it's home and, and they're not going to go anywhere. And, and people like Zusa are fighting to come back home. They just want accountability. No, and these you are you are right. These are these are hardworking blue collar uh, people, largely conservative, uh, and they they want to get back to work. and And what they know is working and providing for their families. That is definitely how they're wired. There. Uh, that said, it seems to me that they would really benefit from bringing in an outside consultant. 
I agree with Zusa. They, they, I, I wouldn't trust anything that somebody provided. The person, this is the fox guarding the hen house. You know, you've got the people investigating the thing, putting their stamp of approval, giving you the green light, all safe, all clear, uh, when they actually are, are bought and paid for by Norfolk Southern. So it sounds, yeah. has there been any effort to bring in an outside consulting firm or outside experts to actually do soil sampling, water sampling, air sampling, to give these people a sense of confidence that actually things are in fact safe? That I'm not sure of. I'm, I'm not sure of any attempts by locals. I mean, I, I wouldn't doubt it if that it's happening, but at least when I was uh, on the ground and reporting and stuff and asking questions, I, I was not aware of anything like that, any kind of grassroots effort to bring, you know, independent, actually independent contractors in to test stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The EPA did set up a, a kind of like a base of operations in downtown East Palestine the day before the last time I visited. And I was told by locals who are, you know, they, they kind of like the town talk was that the building that they rented out was rented for six months. And when I asked the EPA, are you going to be here for six months? The answer I got was, we're going to be here as long as we have to. And I think this is another important aspect of the story. I was told about blue collar Norfolk Southern workers. I met one of them. Um, I, I met ob obviously the, the EPA people who I spoke with. And, and basically you get a sense of, a lot of these people are from Ohio and you get a sense of people are just trying to, to fix this and get on with their lives. And it's a community that's trying to come together. And the reason I'm saying that is because, because of how polarized things are, um, like I, I heard about Norfolk Southern workers who are blue collar that were actually being treated kind of badly by people that they're close with, kind of like, how could you work for mm -hmm. this company? Right. And oh, it, it's, I think it's, it's sure. yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's really important to, to try to look beyond that because th this is so much bigger than that. I mean, this, this is really a story about. Um, the norm in American life, which is that corporations can basically get away with murder by capturing the agencies that are supposed to make, you know, supposed to hold them accountable and, and regulate them and make them safer. Um, but obviously that's, that's not the case. Well, one of the things I found absolutely abhorrent, and I've done a tremendous amount of work with FEMA during my career, that their first claim was that this didn't fall within FEMA's sort of bailiwick. This wasn't in their wheelhouse mm. because they do things like, you know, uh, they do things like hurricanes and floods. And I thought, if this doesn't fall in FEMA's in a wheelhouse, that, then we, we have a big problem. That was literally yeah. drew their excuse. And this is a group of, you know, the people of East Palestine, by the way, I'm, you know, very, very sympathetic to the fact that this didn't happen in Martha's Vineyard. These aren't people who have a bank account or a, a piggy bank where they can say, you know what, I'll just pick up and go for a month and go live at the Four Seasons yeah. over in Pittsburgh, or I'll go take my family and go, you know, to the West Coast for, for a month. These are people who are, are very, very, um, middle America, they don't have the wherewithal to necessarily go and stay and have, be able, even if they thought they'd get reimbursed, they don't have the ability to go and stay at a hotel miles and miles away and go to restaurants for three meals a day for an extended period. So without mm -hmm. FEMA coming in and making those, you know, those funds available uh, and without the federal government doing that and Norfolk Southern doing it, I mean, these people are somewhat between a rock and a hard place, they've got to go mm -hmm. back uh, to their homes, even if they're contaminated. Um, yeah. We're what's what's next? Where you know what's your plan? Are you going back down there uh, to to revisit? Are you following up with these folks? Do you have a, a way to follow up with them? Yeah, I, I'm keeping in touch with them. When I published the story, I sent it to them, and I I plan to go back up there to follow up because I mean this is I the I was happy that I published it almost two or three weeks after the fact, um, because it was right around the time that the media was sort of moving on from East Palestine and, and people were kind of moving on mm -hmm. to the next thing in the news cycle, right? But when I went back, there was still, you know, there's still cleanup crews. There are still these blue containers filled with contaminated material. There are still semi-trucks that are transporting it in and out of town. Uh, it, it hasn't ended for these people. The, the uncertainty hasn't gone away. Uh, as resilient as they are and as optimistic as a lot of them are who I spoke with, you know, it, this is still a reality for them and it's going to persist for some time. So yeah, absolutely. I, I, I plan to follow up. And the impression that I get from these people is that they're they're not going to stop 
as much as you know, they're, they're they're kind of people that think of themselves as you know, we're not, we're not going to complain and we're just going to you know get on with our lives. I also think that they're they're going to try to hold someone accountable uh, and, and try to get some justice for this. I see an awful lot, maybe because I, I see so many things through the lens now of of the recent COVID pandemic. But I see an awful lot of overlaps, just in terms of culturally and and yep. Uh, yep. you know, in the same way that we have all of these people who are harmed by the vaccines and and they're being ignored. Uh, they're being mm-hmm. these people are ignored. They're they're marginalized. They're silenced. Nobody's covering it. Uh, we don't have the mainstream media bringing highlighting what has happened to these people in East Palestine. In the way that you would ex- have expected, given this is an enormous environmental disaster. Likewise, with with COVID, we're not seeing yeah. uh, really the the light uh, exposure of what's happening to people. And there's I, there's a um, just a dismissiveness that's happening amongst yep. in our government officials. Mm-hmm to the suffering that was inflicted upon these people. This wasn't even a natural disaster, people. This wasn't a hurricane or an earthquake or a flood. This was a disaster that was foisted upon them by a a corporation that makes millions and billions of of dollars and that people aren't being held accountable, um, I think is really reflective of, of something very dark, very sinister that's happening. Hmm. Yeah, you don't like I said. You don't need conspiracy theories with like aliens and 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 reptile people. I no. mean, the, the reptile people no. are running the government. <laughs> and and uh, they're, they're maybe, the one, yeah, maybe you know, those maybe those conspiracies had sort of a an emotional valence <laughs> that had a ring of truth for I, people. I, <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah, I will I mean, say. I will. Admi- I, I will admit, Pedro, that I did post. And again, I started my post with the word conjecture. In other words, it, it, this is not founded in fact. It, conjecture. What if this spill in heavily uh, blue collar, unvaccinated uh, East Palestine yeah. was actually uh, to to uh, sort of obfuscate or confound the variables of people getting cancer and autoimmune mm-hmm. diseases and lots of other problems? Uh, you know, is this actually, you know, because it's so easy, given yeah. some of what we're seeing in the behavior, it's very easy to go down that that rabbit hole of, wow, is there something Mm, even worse going on than, as you said, Mm. just the reality? Well, I'll say there are two things to that because that are really important, I think. One is the fact that people are even open to that actually reflects how deeply we distrust uh, the government and and the people that we, the people that are in charge of this country, which I think shows you how unhealthy uh, the status quo is. The fact that we're like, the fact, even like I'm, I would be open to to even considering something like that because I actually think the people that are running this country are that bad and they're that cynical yeah. and they're that vile that they would actually do something like this to their own people. And I think that also contributed to this perception that there may be the reason why Pete Buttigieg and Biden ignored East Palestine was because it made them look bad. You know, maybe this maybe the uh, the, the derailment made uh, our transportation czar who was, you know, as the people of East Palestine are dealing with this stuff, what's he doing? He's talking about how there are too many white people working in construction. <laughs> you know, so I think there, it, it absolutely is plausible that part of the reason he ignored it is because it makes him look bad. And again, yeah. all of these things, like the, 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 the ideas we come up with, like the, the plots and, and all of these alternative theories, they all reflect a truth. And the truth is that m- most Americans feel like the people in charge of this country either don't care about them or hate them. Yeah. Uh, certainly a lot of people feel that way and that, and that they can't trust the press, which is supposed to be the source of information to understand what's, what's out there and what, how to make their choices as, uh, as the governing body of the people. Pedro, we, we've got to kind of uh, roll to a halt here. Uh, thankfully, we're not 150 train uh, car train because it would take an hour and a half to, to slow down it sounds like uh properly any event uh but we really thank you for coming here and sharing uh your your insights with us the you can be followed at at Ameri- emeriticus Amer- Amer- emeriticus yeah emeriticus e-m-e-r-t-i-m-e-m-e is that a what is emeriticus what is that it's a play on uh, a word for a, a recluse a eremite Okay. Very, it's very obscure. I, I, when I created my Twitter in 2017, I was I wasn't thinking that I was going to become a media personality. So, and I just never bothered to think. <laughs> but, you, but you were clever. You were clever. Uh, and then the Substack, uh, give us that address. 
contra.substack.com. And so I'm the political editor at Chronicles Magazine, but this story was published at my Substack, which uh, you can subscribe to at contra.substack.com. Pedro, thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. Well done. And Kelly, uh, I'm going to keep you for a minute. Uh, our okay. producers have impressed upon me that we should make attempts to take calls at the end of every show. If that's See up how to, people feel out if, there. If that's cool for you, let's see yeah. where people are, take their pulse on some of this stuff. Uh, this is Detest. Let's just get a quick couple quick calls in here. Detest. There you are. Oh, and usually the, the mic will mute itself again, and there it goes. Now you got to unmute it again. There we go. We're getting close. Just the microphone is in the lower left-hand corner there, and it, it's also very non-responsive. There you are. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, I'm so sorry there you about go. that. No problem. Um, so I, I always wondered, like, there's this whole, like, like uh, Jeffrey Epstein type of deal going on, and you're not part of that, and I'm not part of that. Like, I'm not thinking about it much. Mm-hmm. But what is your, like, whole take on that? Like, because you're kind of in the in if you know what I mean. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to talk about it like you're not here. <laughs> we're going to put you back in the speaking from the speaking, not because there's any problem with you asking the question. It's really, I really don't know anything. I've heard a couple of rumors and Kelly, you, you may know something more than I, I've heard a couple of rumors that he was an intelligence operator and that he was getting pictures of people in compromising positions and videos and that's why he had lots of money, and that's why he had lots of video equipment, and that he's got lots of material. Now, I don't know, have any idea if that's true or not. I heard various rumors about who he was working for, and I even heard that he may have been a counter espionage for somebody who thought he was working for, was working for him. So what have you heard, Kelly? I, I've heard much of the same. I think there's no question. It's undeniable that there were a lot of very, very powerful people who were involved in what he was doing and with for whom he has he has uh, compromising information, likely video and certainly evidence of their yeah. having been there. Who he was working for, I can't say. Um, he, he clearly, yeah. he, for, as far as I'm concerned, you know, spoiler alert, he did not commit suicide. <laughs> that I can tell you. I, I think uh, I think uh, that's but, become increasingly, increasingly yeah, a concern. Yeah, and, okay, and, but, and I don't know if you I noticed what, who I, I don't know if you noticed Bill Gates' wife on her way out was sort of reporting that Bill Gates had a weird preoccupation with Epstein's lifestyle and who he was. And, and, and I have heard that he had, he had a way of sort of reeling people in, you know, he would use other celebrities who, who he'd get chummy with and then reel people in ju just to have lunch, just let's go talk about it. And I guess he's, was a very charming guy. I mean, come, come to my Island sometimes I'll fly out there. You, you could see how easily people would get sucked into this stuff. Absolutely, because you're in company of other celebrities. Um, but all you had to do is Somebody end up with you your trust, name maybe. on his, you know, name on his guest list. And many of these people, as you said, you know, whether it's Bill Clinton or or Bill Gates and and many many others, had their name not only on the Epstein guest list once or twice, but many of them dozens of times. So I have no doubt that uh, he was able to collect a lot of uh, compromising material on people. I have no clue. I have heard no credit. I should say. I've heard no credible evidence uh, for who it is who right. actually was, was and, working. And not for. only that, I have no, and I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I, have, I feel like I'm, I'm reporting pure rumor to you, and I have no idea what's real and what's yeah. not. I, this yeah. is not even yeah. my opinion. It's just rumor. Uh, 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 but it is disgusting. Agreed. It is disgusting. <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, Kayan, you are up. Hey, Dr. Drew. It's Keon. Keon, uh, how nice you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. Um, so I, I've got a fun one for you guys. This is going to go um, probably into Kelly's bucket. Um, I'm an engineer. I work for the government. Uh, I'm a, a cybersecurity engineer. I, I recently canceled my health insurance because um, I feel like the doctors that I want to see are not going to accept insurance. Mm. Um, I tend to mm. kind of go more along the lines of holistic care and stuff like that. Um, just want to float an idea by you guys to get your opinion. Um, I think what the world needs right now is honest answers, mm. as you've mentioned before. Uh, and my thought on that is this. Um, I feel like accountability uh, and the fear of punishment 
uh, and life-changing consequences may hinder uh, transparency. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, people are afraid of being harmed or hurt. They're afraid, and and they are of the unknown too. Just what might happen. Uh, are you suggesting, Ken, that that people won't come forth and and say, for example, what happened with the pandemic or with something else because they are fearful that that their complicity or their involvement in it might may put them in harm's way? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, Kelly, you, you mentioned before in your bucket that um, accountability is important. And I agree, but um, I think that people are fearful to come forward with answers. It's, and it's, it's, I agree, Ken. It's one of the reasons I fear when people go, you know, say things like, you know, in prison so-and-so, in prison so-and-so. That You say that once and those people are going to shut up. They're going to have attorneys that tell them to shut up and we're never going to get to the accountability. It's going to be a big uh, attorney speak. Uh, Thing. But I think it's why I think it's why you started to see and you have seen over these past uh, couple this past year or so, you've seen people quit their jobs at the FDA, quit their jobs at the CDC. All of a sudden, Robert Redfield's True. very anxious to testify in front of Congress. I, this is what I call it. these are people scrambling uh, to get on the right side of history. These are people scrambling to say, no, 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 no. I know I said that at the beginning, but but I quickly, you know, I'm, I'm over here now to try to sort of mitigate that risk. And I think the people who are truly in harm's way are the people like Fauci who keep doubling down and saying, no, 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 and absolutely won't acknowledge it. The people who come forward on their own and don't have to get uh, subpoenaed into court to tell the truth, you're always better off coming forward and saying, I'd like to give this information up. Then then a, the court of public opinion looks kindly on you, as does the law. It's when you continue to double down and only finally uh, perhaps tell the truth when you've been you know, subpoenaed or arrested um, that that you really are in harm's way and you're, you're at risk. So I think it's kind of a fine line. And Akian, can I give you one piece of advice? You ready? Sure. Yeah. Please get catastrophic coverage. I was just going to say that. I, I, I am yeah. I am fully I fully endorse your plan. It's just if you get in a car accident or a head injury and you end up in a ventilator for six months or yeah. whatever. You know, or you in, need in, a hospital for something. Right. You don't for long be periods county. of time. I understand you can also just declare bankruptcy, but you can't believe how shitty your care can become yeah. if you're yeah. if you're the resources aren't yeah. there to cover it. So At just just it's, the insurance was supposed to be catastrophic here. It's insurance Correct. against catastrophe and so far decide a number that's a cap you don't want to go beyond twenty thousand hundred thousand whatever you feel you can cover and then get insurance for above that it's very right. cheap yeah cool. all right all right thank if you're you. a woman right, i'd buddy. say if you're going to get pregnant too well, that all is in there it's all in there all right well uh shall we kind of wrap I, know, I was thinking the same thing i, I was thinking now if i was your mom <laughs> 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 oh goodness i it's this all is all right. so disturbing to me kelly i it's all so super disturbing it really is that that, well, well, that we're we're finding out all these things that uh, about our business about other people i look the railroad is a key component of the supply chain i i support the railroads i want them to thrive but i don't want them to hurt people it, it's this weird world we're living in now when you can't hold two thoughts together that right. are a little bit different but I'm telling you, but it really, it is overwhelming. And, and there's, it, I, as Pedro said, this is reflective of the fact that people would even consider or that I would even post that, that tweet about, you know, wow, could it be this nefarious? It's because it's reflective of the amount of distrust that people have now in the government, of the powers that be, of big, of big industry, certainly big pharma. Is that all just of these on the agencies. right? Is that just on the right or is it on both sides now? I don't now? think so. I think it's on both sides now. And by the way, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Pedro did kind of gloss over. I thought it was a, a bigger issue. The fact that this movie had been made, I think it was a Netflix movie that had been made with almost an identical storyline, Drew. It happened in a mm -hmm. rural town in Ohio where there's this toxic spill and the government comes in and, you know, covers everything up and people are, I mean, it's, it, white noise, I think, was, is the name of it. It is 
well, eerily. Hey, look, there's similar. another one. Another similar film is called Chernobyl. You know, this this is <laughs> exactly. our government is starting to behave like these these other centralized authorities, and that sh we should right. all be su uh, suspected, uh, right. very upset about that. Everybody. Yeah. So it's with that, uh, we'll all go have a nice weekend. We'll all go have a good weekend, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Kelly, I'm so glad you were here on both these yeah, shows so today. Positive and uplifting um, today. Coming up, uh, 14th, Michael Sanger. He has uh, uh, snake oil science regarding how what's going on in China. Yeah, uh, Doctor. Catch up with him. Yes, Dr. Gad Sad on March 21st. Macus, William Macus, tell us about that. Kelly. Yes, he, he, he's a Canadian oncologist uh, who's going to be reporting on uh, his experience with increased incidences of cancer and his concerns about cancer mm -hmm. risk related to the COVID vaccines. By the way, I just found a really good resource. Uh, I think she was Canadian uh, talking about women's uh, you know, reproductive issues and her data look good. So I'm, I'm once again, getting confused about whether there is a problem with reproduction. Is there a problem? So we got to keep watching the data. And, uh, okay. this is another area that people have controversy and we're just trying to figure it out guys. So, uh, stick with us. We'll get one day. We will find the truth one day. Thanks Kelly. We'll have a good weekend. Um, and Excellent. for everyone else, we'll you see too. you next Tuesday, three o'clock. Thank, thank you. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. But they're so so they're they're down because they're such wimps that they're that they don't understand courtship because they're not being encouraged to court. I guess. Or they're if women are being so tough on men that they're they're just like, hey, I'll stay with my porn, forget it, and it's not worth it. It might be very VR. Sad. It might be VR porn. But yeah. but you're right. I don't know if you tried it. It's pretty spectacular. Really? Do I have to? Do I need a VR thing? It's like, embarrassing I mean... that I've I've may have I know someone that <laughs> <laughs> might have tried it.